Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Christina Calio. Christina, are you ready to be great today? I am so ready. Christina lives in Seattle. Her husband, artist, is it Joey? Joey, yeah. They have two daughters in Seattle and LA. She's a graduate of the University of Washington. She started her career at, at, in LA leading international marketing and sales at Giffen Records from 86 to 2000, touring with bands from Guns N' Roses to Nirvana. In 2000, she took a position at Microsoft leading music business development, first at Windows, and then at MSN, Zoom, and Xbox. As the music industry transitioned from physical music business, CDs to digital, MP3s. In 2017, 2018, she left Microsoft to found Kaleo Music, advising businesses and artists at the intersection of music technology, and worked at Fender to launch Fender Play, a subscription for online guitar lessons. Today, she's a co-founder of ARVR startup Poppins, and supports three nonprofits in Seattle. Christina, thanks for being here today. You're so welcome. Thanks for having me. So Fender, is that like the, the Fender guitar company? Yes. The same like Fender iconic equipment. company? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, and there's in the still business? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Their um, headquarters are in Los Angeles, their business headquarters. And uh, I joined in order to help them launch their subscription for online guitar lessons. But the building itself, I mean, it was an incredible spot. And it was filled with guitars. The people that did the traditional business, working with brick and mortar retail, were all there. So, um, as someone who's been around music for all my life, and a husband who's a musician, so there's probably like I don't know, eight to ten Fenders in our house already. Okay, it was a really great place to be. So, what what do you do for fun? <gasps> oh, I'd say probably um, time with family and friends is the most important thing. I love being on the water. Like anytime anyone invites me, whether it's a mattress or being on the shore or getting in a pool, I'm there. Like, I, I love that. Um, and I love nature. I don't get to do it as often as I like, but any chance I get to go on a hike or go somewhere outside, that's a place for me. Any favorite water sports? Like do you, do you actually do water skiing? You just like hang out the beach or get on the boat? No, I did swimming in school. And so probably just plain old fashioned swimming. Um, okay. Are you pretty good swimming? Then, uh, yeah, I was, I was like, so I went to Newport high school, which did really well in one state. I was like the worst person on the team. Uh -huh. So I was good enough to be on the team, but I wasn't like the top yeah. person. Like I, I can swim, but like, if you said, okay, Jason, if you swim from here to way over there for $10,000, like, hey, I don't know about that. I don't know. I don't know if I can <laughs> you, make you could do it. I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah, you'd make it one way or the other. I think. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You're more confident in my swimming ability than I do. I, I do. I do. Um, so next, you, you'd work with nonprofits. First, I want to talk about is something called the Austrian American Council. Yeah. So, and, and the nonprofit work is probably my favorite work right now. Um, my mother um, is Austrian, was Austrian. She was born there, uh, as was her whole heritage. And uh, she came to America in well, she went to Canada first in 51, but she always had a very strong tie to Austria. And my father was German and I have two sisters. And so we grew up here really as the only family in America. I'm the firstborn. And the Austrian community became something that she really felt compelled to give to and to contribute to. And so she founded this uh, Washington state branch of the Austrian American Council in 1997. And it's a national organization. So there are Austrian American councils all around the United States. And the aim of the organization is just to foster positive relationships between the people of America and Austria. And uh, last year, my mother died in 2019. And last year, the honorary consul of Seattle asked me if I would step in to be the president and help lead those efforts here out of Seattle. And so I'm really happy to be doing that. Have you ever, been, I'm guessing you've been out to Austria before, yes. like how many times? Um, I mean, I was baptized there okay. and um, in the recent years, I've gone pretty much every year. Um, growing up, it was a little less than that, but my parents would go for probably three months a year yeah. um, as they were. So I was in the army. Of course, I tried everywhere. From my point of view, Salzburg is the most beautiful city in the world, right? It's like, it's, it's not even close, right? Like people yeah. see you know, Venice, Florence, different places. Like it's for me personally, like Salzburg, it's the mountains, the atmosphere, the vibe. Yeah, to me, it's Salzburg, my city. Okay, well, when you go again, you need to go to this very small village that my mom is from um, called Alpbach. Okay. And it's 
not far. It's kind of between Munich and Innsbruck, mm -hmm. close to Kufstein, so not too far from Salzburg. Okay. Um, and it's very much that sound of music, mm -hmm. kind of green Alps, but skiing in the winter. I forgot all about Innsbruck, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, that's a just that's a, just this is a nice area. Yeah, it's breathtaking. I mean, you go there and it's just as much as I like the water, the mountains there of Austria yeah. also just speak to me. Like I could just sit there in front of that house and drink it all in. So you, you might not know this, but how many Austrian Austrian Americans live in the United States? Is because usually you know, hear like Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, you know, all these different ethnicities. Like you yeah. don't really hear like Austrian Americans. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up, but I'd love to give you that stat. Um, it's a pretty strong community here in the Seattle and the Pacific Northwest area. Um, one area that's of particular interest to me is the new Austrian citizens. So Austria uh, amended their dual citizenship laws a couple of years ago to give kind of a speedier dual citizenship to people who are descendants of victims of Nazi okay. aggression. And so that's been really rolling into effect the last few years. And just here in the Seattle area, we have over 200 new Austrian American okay. citizens. Um, and since many of them are Jewish, we are putting a, you know, uh, taking that opportunity and really highlighting Holocaust education and working with a lot of them that are passionate um, about now, making sure that their stories are told. Now your two daughters, are they still at yes. home with you or they're at the house? So uh, one's in Los Angeles okay. and she wants to be an artist. So she's doing music. Okay. Um, and the other is currently at home. Like she, she went to college and then the pandemic and yeah. came back and, you know, she's now, um, she's actually taking a phlebotomy class right now. So okay. she's So a question for you is like, they're, they're both born in America, right? Yes. So how do you make sure that you know, like, keep the tradition going like oh, how, the, the Austrian upbringing like the Austrian traditions like the what happened back over there and still be like you know function in America so to speak hopefully that question makes sense yeah yeah uh it, it it's been a part of our culture I think because we were such a small family so many of the Austrian or even European traditions are just our traditions um and Gianna, the youngest, she has gone with me the last several years to Austria. Uh, we've inherited the house that my mom was born in and that her mom was born in. So this very old house um, that's requiring some extra care now. And and she loves to go. Um, and they both, Isabel has been many times too. But yeah, they, it's there in them. Okay, all right. So I just thought of something like when, when I was stationed in Germany, I took my kids to this place. There was a salt mine in Austria somewhere. Mm -hmm. It was it was like it was by the um it was by Bavaria, like the Eagles Nest, the trailer head, there's a town right there in mm -hmm. Austria, some kind of salt mine. I can't remember what it was. I remember that was a good time going down the salt mines and stuff. Yeah. There are a lot of silver and gold mines also in that area and in Austria. And we did that one year too, where we went. I mean, it's kind of creepy, yeah, right? You is, get yeah. in a little roller coaster yeah. type thing you and you go down. You gotta, put, a, you gotta put that jacket on over you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the helmet and the whole yeah. thing. And it gets really dark and really cold. And yeah. So you have any like any like goals or focuses for the Austrian American Austrian -American Council, Council coming up? Yeah. So there's a big uh, Austrian American Day, which Clinton signed into law um, in September every year. And last year we did an event where the general counsel from Los Angeles flew up. Um, and we did it at the Holocaust Center, which is not very far from here, uh, the Holocaust Museum of Seattle Center. And it's a beautiful spot. Um, and we'll do that again this year to welcome the new Austrians, but also just commemorate this friendship between the two countries. Um, there's a MyFest coming up. So, uh, and th these are all open to everybody. So anyone could go. Um, and that's just the May Day celebration. And there'll be live music and food and dance and people coming together. Um, and there'll be several others. There's an Oktoberfest being planned now. Okay. There's usually a holiday party. So yeah, there are events all year long. Nice. So next, let's talk about your what you do with the Seattle Theater Group. Yes. So I've just recently joined the board of the Seattle Theater Group. Um, which is a nonprofit uh, known as the People's Theater. And really um, the mission there is to preserve some of these old buildings like the Moor and the Paramount and the Neptune and make music accessible to everybody and entertainment more broadly. So there are a lot of plays and 
musicals and other shows that take place, education, uh, all kinds of things. So uh, I have been contributing to the annual fundraiser, which is actually happening on May 6th. There's an online auction that people go check out at stg.com. And uh, all sorts of really interesting things are happening. Again, I'm just kind of stepping into the role. So how do you get involved with STD? Someone invited you, hey, you yeah. should come help us out or yes. how did that happen? Someone on the board recommended me um, and they were filling a couple positions. So I think there were other two other women that joined at the same time that, that I did. Um, and the, the team at STG really does involve the board in their thinking. And it's, so it's a really nice relationship and to be asked and considered and have a chance to put some feedback in as they consider different initiatives. Now what's, what is theater? Does that mean music theater, just like regular theater or everything combined? So there are a lot of music concerts that take place in those venues. So, you know, that's a staple. There are festivals like the Thing Festival, which um, takes place out at Fort Warden or Port Townsend. Um, and then there are, you know, Hairspray and Phantom of the Opera and the Temptations show, which opened not too long ago and I went to. So it's a mix of different kinds of theater. And that's also a nonprofit. Yes, it's a nonprofit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think that I didn't fully appreciate that when I joined. And now that I've had a chance to really look, it's incredible the amount of things that STG does for the Seattle community. And then Calio Music, is that still in business right now? Or? Yeah, so Calio Music, I started when I left Microsoft. <clears throat> and my primary work with um, Calio Music is for code.org, which is this global curriculum for students to learn computer science in schools. Um, especially girls and underrepresented students. And it's a fantastic program that was started by Hadi Partovi and his brother. And this is the 10th year coming up of efforts. And it is a wildly successful computer encoding uh, teaching platform. So let's talk about starving artists for fast flight. You already heard the term starving artist, right? Yeah. Is it just the fact that the artist is so focused on creating good art that they don't worry about the business part, or is the fact that the art like the when they learn like how to sing or whatever the case may be there's no business sense like it's like there's never a combined combination yeah. you know that's a great question um so i don't think there's one answer just like there's not uh, one type of teacher you know that everybody has their own strengths and weaknesses that they bring but in my experience the artists for the most part want to make art primarily they're not in it to do business. They really want to make art. And those two things are hard to reconcile. And especially today, it used to be a lot easier, I think, to be an artist. And if you were signed to a major, you had people that were helping you with a lot of the business. And if you were an independent, maybe you didn't really care or you had support from your family and friends. But in the meantime, almost everybody has to do a mix of promotion, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or whatever else, in addition to the art. So it's, it's changed as far as starving artists. I mean, yeah, it's really hard to make a living in music. Yeah. Cause there's a, a, a bar, like two doors down, three doors, across the central saloon every night they have like five or six live bands. Right. Yeah. Some are like, like, man, how, how are you not making, like making more money than this? Although like, I don't know if somebody needs to tell you the truth that you can't sing. Right. Oh, some of them. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's hard. I mean, and the pandemic really took a hit on everybody too, because a lot of clubs had to close. Yeah. A lot of clubs had to let people go. Um, and don't most, and don't most artists actually make the money off touring versus like album sales or streaming, streaming numbers? Yeah. Streaming numbers are tough. You know, um, it, I, my personal perspective is there's more opportunity for an indie artist now than there was in the past, because at least you can record something and distribute it yeah, through. I know Everywhere. some people would put stuff on SoundCloud or yeah. Spotify. Yeah. I just read another stat that in the meantime on Spotify, they're releasing 100,000 songs every day. That's insane. So you imagine how hard it is to I, actually. I, 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 how do you stand out? Like, I mean, exactly. you, you, you pretty much got to have some kind of brand market or marketing plan ahead of time, right? Like, oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Your plan can't be just to put it out on Spotify and hope you get on a playlist. There's a funny one for you. So, um, 
I was I know it was Vegas the last few days for a wedding, right? We're like walking around Fremont Street. And this guy hands me a CD. Can you buy my CD? Like, first of all, how am I gonna play this? Like, <laughs> yeah. like, 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 can you come like year 2020 or something, right? Yeah. And it just blew my mind that this, these people are like passing out CDs trying to sell them. Like, how how will I play this? If you tell me how I can play this, I'll, I'll, I'll buy it from you, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just shows you how much things are constantly evolving. Yeah. Um, when I was at Geffen Records, that was the prime more primary format mm -hmm. was CDs. That's what we were selling in different formats. You know, like the type of packaging that you would put into Tower yeah. Records and all of that. And then, um, you know pretty hard to find a CD these days or to figure out where to play yeah. it. Although there is a little bit of a resurgence that I'm seeing, like yeah. a little bit people like, well, if this is the time to buy a CD in a lot of ways, that is like a master. Yeah, you know, yeah you're if, right. I mean, you see why a CD, we have like a 20 page of paper yeah. in there, you know, all the mm -hmm. backgrounds and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm like, I can't imagine like starting off like a singer or whatever musician, and I, you know, you're trying to get venues and stuff. And then someone says, Hey, what do you do with your publisher rights? Like, mm -hmm. how, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, just, and, and I know like uh, different people are selling publishing rights, like millions of dollars, you know, and is that, is that a good deal or a bad deal? You think you want to keep that publishing for later on in life, don't you? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I mean, this is fairly recent, this move to people monetizing all of their publishing. I think it's a smart move because the songs themselves are very valuable. Mm -hmm. Uh, traditionally as an artist to manage, collect, and then even pass on the rights to your songs is difficult. And I can understand why a lot of these artists see the appeal in selling, um, and getting a check that is large, which a lot of these checks are very yeah. large. Yeah. Um, it's very clean, um, yeah, it, and it's strategic, I think, on the part of the people that are now. If those. they sell the publishing, they can still sing the songs and stuff like that, right? Oh, yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. It's just that somehow they make less money long term. Yeah, they've okay. they've sold the rights to ownership of those songs. It's really the music business is so complicated, which is another reason I think that it's going to really be evolving right now, which is part of what we're doing at Pop Ins. Yeah. But um, did are you an artist? Do you no, play? No. no, no. Okay. Um. When, and you you may know this already, but when a song is released, there are two owners. So there's the publisher who owns the song itself, the writing, the lyrics. Um, and then there's the master, which is the recording, which is usually the label. So for example, when I'm um, licensing songs for Code.org's dance party, I work with both the publisher which could represent 10 or 12 individual artists and the label. So you have to get lots of approvals before you can do anything with a song. So success across a relative term, right? But from your time dealing with the music industry, like what percentage of artists actually think are like are successful, right? And success could be like, you know, mean uh, like a title strip or it could be like, you know, you turn the country and, you, you know, make money, you know, like, it's really low. Yeah. The percentage. I think so. Yeah. Um, I saw a stat recently that it's one or two percent of artists that are making any money, you know, or any think it, anything over ten thousand dollars, I think it was a year on yeah. Spotify. Um so yeah, it's a good question as far as like what's the measurement of success? Yeah. Is it strictly monetary? Is it being able to make a living and do art? Is it like, you um, know, I tour the country, I do what the hell I want to, you know, yeah. play music and great venues, meet people every day. And I eat, you know, bologna sandwiches on my pickup truck. I'm who knows, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, there are a lot of interviews with artists too, where they're like, you know, when you're an artist, you have to do it. Like you don't really have a choice. Yeah. So um that, which falls back into that original question, like balancing art and business and how do you do that and i think because a lot of artists prefer the art yeah. then they they let go of the business side i am guess your artist you really can't tell yourself you know if i don't you know quote unquote making a fire is gonna quit right because like you got to keep on going until whenever right because most mm -hmm. artists nowadays like robert plant from Liz zeppelin he's turned with um i can't remember so a bluegrass singer they're turning across the country you know selling out arenas all over all over the united states yeah yeah. And then uh, last year, I even just got on the podcast, Brett Green. He runs New Tech Northwest. 
and he was like the he was um the road manager for the uh, Ramon for ten years, right? Oh my God! Yeah, he's telling me <laughs> he like, had some good stories. Yeah, he had some good stories, but he was telling me like you know how most rock bands had the, like two buses like pimped out bands or whatever. They had like a um, um, suburban and a U-Haul, and and I was like, why you have no buses? Like that's the money I'm wasting, right? I don't need all that. Mm-hmm. So instead of spending X amount of money on these buses, we live simple and the money's for us on a later day, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of ways to tour. I think that there are, it's harder and harder to tour the bus these days. Um, you see a lot of people touring in sprinter. Bands. Okay. Like that is more comfortable, but still, yes, still tough. So from your time at Giffen Records, I'm sure you met a lot of music people, artists, bands, whatever it be. Which one was your favorite? Like it doesn't have to, whatever your metrics, like, you know, the most fun to be around, the most personable, yeah. best music. What's your, what's your best group? Um, that's a hard question because I worked with a lot of great artists, but I'd say um, Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses. Uh, just, I was hoping you yeah, say that. Yeah. I mean, uh, and they were all great, but in, pati- in particular, Duff McKagan and Slash okay. worked so hard mm-hmm. and they were always lovely and just great to be around. Um and uh, yeah, they, they were terrific. Uh, they were a band too that, um, you know, Geffen committed to breaking Guns N' Roses. It took a couple of years of pushing that first record mm-hmm. before there was success. Yeah, I remember was watching success. the Jogo came out, it was like, everybody's mind was blown. Like, yeah. what is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they wore the rock band for a good amount of time, you know, like three or four years, right? Oh, I much more than that, yeah. I would say, yeah. Um, they had that first album, then what was what Use the Illusion one and two came out. Right. Yeah. Yep. November, November Rain. Yep. And then I guess I guess they started having conflict with the uh, actual Rose. He, I guess, according to the, what I remember reading, like he started acting like crazy and stuff, like doing like weird stuff, you know. Well, I think this goes back to artists are not necessarily business people, and they're also in that same group of artists where they're unpredictable and yeah. passionate, and that's part of what makes them great artists. You know, so so Axel worked hard too. Uh, You know, I remember at the beginning um, because I was doing international. So I was doing international sales marketing. So I would work with uh, companies, uh, countries around the world. And then in each of those countries, we would develop a plan. So you'd still need a publicity plan, a marketing plan, a radio plan, all of those kinds of things. On the publicity side, that meant that I often had the artists in my office or or, uh, putting them on the phone with journalists in different countries to prepare for whatever single or album launch was coming out. And Axel in particular, there were a lot of times where his preferred time was in the middle of the night. Okay, I can imagine. So, you know, there was was stuff like that. Um, But yeah, really um, great. Aerosmith was also fantastic to work with. Um, I have a great memory just since we're talking about the artist piece of one time we were doing a set of interviews, uh, and phoners with Joni Mitchell and she came, she decided that she wanted to eat her lunch at my desk. So she came into my office and sat down and she was just talking. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, which was great. I mean, I was thrilled, you know, um, uh, and she was talking about her art, her paintings that she does and that how what a terrible businesswoman she was and she loves to paint so she needs to do it but she just gives them all away yeah <laughs> that's not the best business to do yeah. right there yeah yeah so um, it made an impression on me though that yeah. you know she she recognized that and she was still just going to keep moving forward with her art so what's the one artist that you you pay to see right right now Oh, there's probably a lot of artists yeah. I would pay. I would say, actually, no, I do pay to see yeah. like artists. Um, what? Let's see. Um, you know, I just missed like that Gary Clark Jr. I think came through. Oh, did he? That I was didn't know that. maybe it was a little further. That's the that's the guitarist. That's that a good artist. Awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to see that Talking Heads. Heads, okay. The next week, I think it okay. is. Um, yeah, Seattle does have like Seattle Tacoma both has like pretty good people coming through. Yeah, it, like entertainers. Yeah, and uh, there's a whole bunch of local artists too that I love to go see. Yeah. Alex Shaw, Zan Fiskum, Toma Nakayama, Sassy Black, who's now moved to Atlanta, but 
Um, you know, there's some great local talent. There's a nonprofit called um, Sonic Guild, who's actively nurturing talent in Seattle. And they have a program um, for members with a show every month that features local artists. I mean, Seattle's been known as a music channel for quite a while now. Hasn't yeah. It? I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, ironically, I think in some ways I grew up loving music and decided to move to Los Angeles because I thought that's where I could get some experience in music and that I would come back to Seattle. Um, and at that time, a lot of bands would just skip Seattle. Yeah. You know, they would just go from San Francisco to Vancouver. Yeah. You know, um, And while I was in Los Angeles, everything exploded up here with yeah. Nirvana, um, which is another band I liked to had a great good time working with but um yeah the timing was a little off on that <laughs> what advice do you have for new artists getting just getting started uh be yourself don't try to copy what somebody else is doing um write your own songs and uh just persevere that's hard you know and and i see that with my own daughter who's pushing to do that right now it's it's a hard business but i think the most important thing is just to know that going in and work hard. So your daughter, what's she actually, is she trying to be a singer, a play yeah. instrument, be a singer? Yeah. I mean, she has several instruments, so she had piano lessons and what, guitar what lessons. What music she, and, or does she sing in? Um, I would put it, she might hate it that I would say this, and she doesn't have one genre, but the last thing I heard was kind of beach housey. Okay. Um, a little Lana Del Rey, maybe. Okay. Um, but she also likes, you know, screamo. Like she okay. likes to like do that. Now, how much too. do you think you influenced her to take this career path, or how much was I like, actually on her own? You know, uh, I don't think it was me. I think it was probably more my husband okay. Joey, um, okay. who is actually a professional musician. So that's all he does um, for his career. Uh, and again, I I think it's just in her. Okay. It's, you know, I think both both my daughters are artists. All right. So next, let's talk about a project you worked on back then at Microsoft Zoom. Mm -hmm. So Zoom, I remember, came as like a pair to the iPod, iPod, I think. Mm -hmm. So why do you think Zoom, you know, like didn't make it, so to speak, you know? I think we were just too early. Um, a lot of the mobile phone capabilities and entertainment uh, and a lot of the things you see today on phones, we had with Zoom. Um, but it was people weren't quite ready for it all of the ideas weren't really second nature to people yes i remember it was a way way better product than, than what anything apple had at the time or anybody else at the time right it was a good product yeah it absolutely was um and it did a lot of things that a lot of other players didn't do so many too many things maybe yeah, yeah maybe apple's genius at making things simple yeah you know why do you think Microsoft has like come out with a Microsoft Zoom version two or something like that? Uh, Michael, I mean Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft decided to get out of um, okay. that business, which doesn't mean that it couldn't get back into that business. But um, it was it was a decision that I think, along with a lot of other things, there's stuff you want to do yourself, and there's stuff that you're happy to have third parties yeah. do using your tools. Do you still have one? I got a couple of them. You, yeah. You, you know, and you still listen to them and play with them. Yeah. And um, so they still work. They still work. Okay. And if you watch, I just saw a trailer for Guardians of the Galaxy, uh -huh. the new one that's coming out, and Zoom features in that again. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty funny. That's pretty nice. Yeah. So, what got you started in music? What got you interested in it? Uh, just liking music, I think. So, uh, in Austria, it's a different kind of music, but you can't go to a restaurant in these little villages without a guitar player and accordion, or even at my grandmother's house, if we were visiting, someone would come. And my dad was uh, uh, played piano beautifully. And so in the evenings growing up, that's we would gather around the piano and he would play music. Um, so I grew up with music. And then of course, as soon as you get into like junior high and high school, you're looking for like punk rock or whatever is gonna be kind of against the grain a little bit. And um, that was discovering new music on KXP, which was KCMU at the time, was just, um, I mean, that's all we wanted to do um, was sneak into clubs or go out to clubs or um, listen to the radio. And yeah. By what time period was it like you were like, okay, 
I really like music and I want to do it as a career. When did that happen? Yeah. After I was working at Geffen. <laughs> Um, so I, I thought I would be a diplomat or go into some kind of international relations. Um, I graduated with a degree in political science. Um, I did an internship in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian. So I was very much focused on kind of maybe a political path. And I, after graduating, I said, well, I'm just going to take a break for three months. And I moved with two friends, two girlfriends down to Los Angeles just to get it out of our system. Like, let's just go down for three months. We'll pick oranges. We'll jump in pools. We'll go to the beach. And then we'll come back to Seattle. And we'll get real jobs. Um, and it, which included like getting some experience and doing those kinds of things. And so one of the jobs I applied for was the receptionist at Geffen Records, which only had 30 people working at it at the time. And, and I got it. So I got a job in the mailroom and it's the classic story. It ended up turning into a real job, yeah. but I think I'd been there, uh, three months and three different divisions said, Hey, why don't you jump on board in our group? And that's when it became like real, like, okay. Oh, this is actually a career. Nice. So how long did you end up being down in LA? 15 years. 15 years. Okay. Yeah. And when did you yeah. move back to Seattle? I moved back after having my second daughter. Okay. So in 2000, I started at Microsoft and we bought okay. a home up here and all of that. So how did that work? I can imagine like going from Geffen. I mean, I'm sure there's a business corporation, what it kids me, but it's still like a busy business. Like, you know, Axel Rose, Johnny Mitchell, like kind of craziness and going from that to Microsoft, you know, which are, to me is like bureaucratic, big time corporation. Like how did that transfer go for you? Uh, it was probably gentler than you might think because they hired me to interface with the music industry. So I was still spending so much time with the people that I already knew, the managers, the record labels, the artists, the others. And um, they were just getting into music. So the teams that I was on were also kind of focused on entertainment. So uh, I'd say at Microsoft, it it is definitely a huge company but you still find your own, it almost felt like working at a small company within a large company, Okay. our, our group. So you, you've been a lot of live music being used to your, your career. You have like a favorite place to go to some music live. Um, you know, the gorge is hard to beat. Yeah. Um, have you been out there? No, you haven't been out to the gorge no. ever. No. Oh my God. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I, I suck. Yeah. Well, you don't suck, but, um, another one, red rock okay. I've, haven't been to, yeah, that, but I would Utah, like to right? go to. Was it someplace else I'm thinking about? It, you know, I don't know. Okay. Utah, Arizona, somewhere there. Utah. Yeah, I think I'm sure it is. Um, <laughs> today, um, the Neptune is a great place for a live show. So is the Moor. Um, yeah, where else is really fun? Tractor is always a good time. Okay. You know, there's in the meantime, there are more and more um, places coming up that are open that it have. Oh, if you haven't been to the new crocodile yet, that's great. Is it? Okay. Yeah. And the clock out lounge up on Capitol Hill Beacon Hill is great. Okay. Yeah, how, there's a lot of great venues. How often are you able to get out and actually go to see live music in person with all the stuff you have going on? You make it like a, is it like a, you make a priority to go see a live music once a month? That's the hell you're busy in right now or like, I like to say, yes, I'm not usually the one that's finding it, but I'm lucky in that I've got a group of friends, especially one friend. Uh -huh. Her name is Kyla Fairchild. She um, started No Depression, which was, uh, she's just a music person. And she's really good about saying, hey, this show, that show. Um, and then one of our partners at Poppins is Terry Morgan, who's, okay. do you know Terry? No, well, actually, he's, I have a question about him. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I know he's a, he's an advisor for you, right? Yes. Like, how did that come about? Like, how did he become an advisor for you? Why is it important to have an advisor for your company? And like, what, how does he add value to you, yeah. to your company? So I met Terry when he was managing the Posies, which is a Seattle band that had national success. And I was at Geffen Records. So, so you know him for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So a pretty long time. And he's just an instrumental person in the Seattle music scene, you know, he was involved in starting the show box all the way through to he's very involved now in a new venue out at um, Carnation Farms, which I had the chance to go to just uh, a couple of weeks ago. And that's another great venue on the east side. 
So um, we stayed in touch. Um, he's done all kinds of incredible work. He did a festival, a light festival called Borealis just before the pandemic. Um, and when we started Poppins, um, I, he, we talked and he had, was managing Zan Fiscum, who was on The Voice um, and Alex Shaw. And uh, they both came in and did holograms with us. So he was very interested and it just turned into, let's bring you on board. So most of us have like a board of ours, like three or four people. Why do you only have one? We're still just getting started. Even though we had our first release in June of 2021, uh, my co-founder who I also met at Microsoft, Brian Lee and I have been experimenting, working with artists, um, testing the limits of what we can do, pushing into 3D Live, which is a new area. And so that's been our focus more than fundraising or getting a board together. Okay. So I, I found this like, I could be in this wrong, but your platform is actually on something called Former Vision. Yes. Can you explain like, well, first yep. of all, like why, why choose that company? Like why not do it yourself? All those kind of things. Right? And do you, yes. do you actually plan on doing this? Like you actually, I, this is a bad way to term it. Do you actually plan to kick Former Vision to the curb and like do it yourself? What's the plan with that? So Former Vision also kind of stems from early days at Microsoft at HoloLens. So I first saw AR VR technology at HoloLens about 10 years ago. And Formavision um, is a platform that's developing augmented reality, virtual reality technologies focused on enterprise. So think 3D Zoom. Brian Lee, who's my co-founder, had been working with them, advising them for about five years. When he called me, we were working on some other things together and said, do you think that there's an entertainment platform for this? And I did. Um, and so we started talking more and we've built Poppins using the Form of Vision platform. So no, we, we don't have any um, view towards leaving Form of Vision. We think they're amazing and they're really uh, world-class, uh, especially in 3D live streaming. I don't know if there's anyone better. And they're, um, they're out of Seattle also? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have to gotta give them a certain percentage of profits or like, how's that work? Or like, are they, are they, are they, are they on your cap table or something or? Uh, no, I mean, we're a partner okay. and a customer. Okay, all right. And so you found your co-founder at Microsoft, right? Yes. And so how long have y'all known each other? Um, let's see, I wonder when I met Brian. Brian and I met in the Zoom days. So, oh, so a long time ago. Yeah, Brian was a vice president at Microsoft in the entertainment and devices division, which included working with Jay Allard, who started Xbox, as we launched a hardware product and music. Um, so I would guess that was probably uh yeah, I mean it's probably been, been 15 years. Okay. So how do you like balance between so like how do you make sure like okay, I'm gonna focus on this, I'm gonna focus on that? And you know, you always hear these horror stories, co-founders breaking up and tearing the company apart. So how do you make sure that all that bad stuff that happened or you make sure you both add what you need to do to the company? Uh, I think on that we're a really good match in that we're pretty different. So we have that history. So we've worked together in the past. So we both knew each other. Um, but we don't always see things the same way. And we recognized early on that that was actually really beneficial. So we can talk that through and share those perspectives and then come up with something better than either one yeah. of us would come up alone. Okay. So I'm, I'm sure. And I think we're both dedicated and we both understand at this point how to work through a conflict like that to get. And to are both of you like doing this full time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like with me, like I don't have a co-founder right now, but like me, I'm an introvert. Right. So if I have a co-founder, they can't be an introvert. Right. Like, what, right. are we, what are we going to do? We both going to stand here and not say anything, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, And I'm not a creative person either. Yeah. So, I, so I need like an extroverted, a creative person, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's good to know what your strengths and your weaknesses are. And, you know, it, I remember the first time I had a manager and we did one of those tests, you know, those tests they make you do where you're like, I'm green and you're blue yeah. and, yeah. We, you know, we're wah, wah, whatever. Um and we were really different and I was kind of concerned, you know, this must've been early on. It might not even have been at yeah. Kevin. And they're like, no, 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 that's good. That's, you know, we want that. We want to be able to kind of like support each other and have strength in different areas. It makes the team better. 
And how many people are on your team, including you and your co-founders? So it's Brian and I, and then Terry. Okay. And then we've hired vendors okay. when we need things. So we've hired a publicist. Mm -hmm. We hired a designer to help with the logo. Um, we hired someone to help us with the website. Okay. But for the most part, it's just me and Brian. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, no. <clears throat> I'm so getting good at setting up things. Like, you know, <laughs> we have this mobile studio. We were just up in Vancouver this weekend for a conference. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm getting pretty good at like unclipping stands. And, it's it's like, an amazing stuff you things. learn. Like, yeah. you know, like, like I can edit videos now, do design stuff, you know, like, uh, yeah, it's amazing what you can learn. Yeah. I can load a to. Pelican case. I can exactly right. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, some of this stuff. And that's, that's more difficult than you think it would be yeah. doing the plug case, take all that cushion of stuff out. So what is um, volumetric video? So this is what... Um, Poppins uses uh, from Form of Vision to capture our avatars or our holograms. So volumetric video technology uses depth cameras surrounding the person or object. So we're really fo focused on people. So the main studio has over 51 cameras and you stand almost in a steel dome that's got the cameras at different heights in different areas and perform with no motion cap suit, it's just the artist as they are. And then that's stitched together through proprietary software over a period of usually days. It's an incredible amount of data. It's more data than all the cameras capture during the Super Bowl. So just like terabytes of data that then get pulled together to create this 3D lifelike image of the artist. Um, so that's that's the volumetric video piece of it. And that's, is that something a form of vision does for you? Is something completely different? Yes. So form of vision has built all of the technology that we are built on top of. And this tech use is like relatively new technology or this stuff that's been around for a while? Um, so it's been around for a while, but it hasn't hit the mainstream, okay. so to speak. Uh, we Last time I checked, which was months ago, there were only 100... 125 studios that I could find around the world that were capturing people in volumetric video. And uh, I couldn't find anyone else who was doing 3D live streaming okay. the way that we were, where it's actually projecting a hologram in real time that can talk back to you um, in your home or elsewhere. So next, talk about this thing. You are, you are finalist and music ally X global showcase for startups and everything music. Yeah. Was that, was that pretty recent? Yeah, that was, um, it's their inaugural uh, award. Pretty, or, pretty big deal. Yeah, it was great. Music Ally is a great company for music and tech based out of London. And um, they had hundreds of applicants. So to be one of six in the area we're in, chosen to be a finalist was really I mean, gratifying, yeah, validating. Yeah. You validating know. Yeah. So why do you think your your company got picked for this versus all the other ones? What do you think you did that made y'all stand out? Oh, I think it's the uh, transformative nature of holograms for music and for artists. So I, I draw this comparison sometimes. When I started at Microsoft, my job was to go to the record companies and convince them to go digital. And they were kind of like, well, our, we're selling a lot of CDs. Like who wants an MP3? Like, you know, you're crazy. Um, and I think sometimes if you show someone a hologram or AR or VR, they're like, I mean, it's cool, but why? Like, I don't really need that. And our belief is that that is the next evolution of music and video. And in a few years, we won't be able to remember a time where we couldn't see something in 3D yeah. if we wanted to. So that's someone's using your, your company, right? And they're, they're doing a concert like live in person at some venue. I'll make this number up. And I suppose the ticket costs fifty dollars to see them actually in person, right? Mm -hmm. And then how much does the person back at home have to pay? Like is it the same price as their live venue, like in person? Is like a discounted rate? How's that work? So uh sideways answer a little bit, but one of the things that Brian and I learned at Microsoft as the digital music and entertainment ecosystem evolved was that it was very hard to predict what the business model would be and that there was room for many business models. Okay. So we've embraced that and uh, challenged ourselves to be very flexible 
And we are working very closely with the artists to determine how they want to go to market. Okay. So uh, initially, uh, and even today, actually, we talked with an artist who wants to go this route, which is to release an NFT. Okay. So the augmented reality, the 3D master, if you will, of the song is available and people can sell that to fans as an NFT. Um, over time, I mean, you can imagine all kinds of different ways. Okay, yeah, that definitely could be many, compensated. many business models. Yeah, where you were kind of going with um, someone at home versus someone in the venue. <clears throat> I think a, an easy way to think about that is when people pay the extra $400 so they can go get their picture taken for two minutes before or after in a VIP meet and greet. Um, if you, if the artist stepped into one of our studios, they could beam into anyone's living room or bedroom and take a picture with them. Okay. So it's, and even have a conversation. So very similar, but the artist doesn't actually have to be standing next to the person in real life or get on a plane. Man, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's so then you also received a grant from ASCAP Lab and, and NY Media, like it was one of four startups. That yeah. Did that. Yeah, y'all doing some big time stuff. Like you're gonna get some, a lot of accolades recently. That's good. It's yeah, it's good. It feels good. Validating, exciting. Yeah, yeah, it does. And I think again, because it's such a nascent uh, technology, and the business hasn't really been navigated yet as far as rights. We were talking about publishing yeah. and master rights before, for example, in music. It's really good to be working with some of these established companies like ASCAP or NYC Media Labs or Universal Music Group as someone else has been very supportive as we just develop ideas and brainstorm and talk through like, how does this actually work? And when and how are the rights holders and artists going to get paid? And the last one I found was something called BPI Tech Springboard Program. Yeah, so that is the British phonographic um, okay. industry. So similar to the RIAA here, the people put the Grammys on. So um, that's that's actually been really fun. South by Southwest, we ended up working with an indie label that's also affiliated with BPI and meeting a bunch of those guys. Um, that organization has something called the Tech Springboard, where they're really pulling together traditional industry and new technologies to build opportunities that wouldn't be there otherwise. And like, how do you find out about those opportunities? I'm sure you have some background in the music industry to help you out, but like, how do you find all these opportunities that go apply for and compete for? Yeah, I mean, ASCAP, um, NYC, that was someone at Universal Music Group recommended us. And so we spoke with them and that ended up working out. Um, Music Ally, I think, I don't know if I saw it or someone reached out, you know, in some ways the music business is still a small industry. Yeah. So, um, when the pandemic started, there were a couple of these groups that sprung up. There's a Friday call. I'm on every Friday at nine o'clock with a group of marketers and artist managers, and we all talk and compare notes and yeah. help each other. And so, uh, yeah, things, things just kind of, um, come up. Okay. So that's all about this. Um, well, you answered the question, I'm going to pour me a drink. But who's an artist like you, you've known like that it didn't didn't make it right? But you're not like, man, this person should have made that. This person had everything, they had the talent, they had the skills. Like, but for some reason, they didn't like become famous or, or so to speak, right? Um, I'm sure you have like hundreds of them. Yeah, uh, there's there's a lot of those. Um, this is a little bit of a a success story, maybe, but. Um, I watched David Geffen get behind a couple of artists when we were at Geffen Records, Guns N' Roses being one of them, Maria McKee, who was in, in Lone Just Being Another, and not letting go, just saying, I'm going to work this band. Like, this is going to continue to be a priority. Sonic Youth, to some degree, was that way also, which is probably why Nirvana signed to Geffen Records. So. There, there are still ways, I think, to support or to believe in these artists long term. Um, but the industry has certainly changed in that yeah. there's less of that flexibility because everyone's hurting on the money side. Yeah, yeah. So I could be wrong, but I think like LA, Seattle, Austin, Nashville, New York City, like no, like music hubs, right? Yeah. Is any other cities out there like known, like 
or, or music hubs that I'm missing? Um, I mean, London. London, okay. Always, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, you know where there's a lot happening right now is Africa. Okay. Um, and in particular, maybe Nigeria. Okay. Um, so that's a place to watch for sure. In the same way, obviously, that if we, maybe not obviously, but if we had this conversation, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, Latin music wouldn't be at the forefront yeah. the way it is now. You know, I think Bad Bunny was the biggest artist of the year on Spotify last year. Yeah. Um, and I think there's there will be a uh, wave from Africa okay. coming. Talk about your your y'all what y'all did in South South by Southwest recently. Yeah, that was great. Um, so there was an indie label called Big Indie, who's based in the UK and in Austin, and they saw something that we had done with Sir Mix a lot here and they were interested in doing something and they also have a print magazine called Licks which is out so uh we did an event at South by Southwest we had a studio not far from all of the activities and five artists came in to the studio and one at a time they performed one to three songs and then answered questions and talked to people both in the room. So, you know, it was a studio, there was some people there and a photographer and wherever they were tuning in from around the world. And tuning in is probably the wrong word because <laughs> that was, you know, someone in Romania who had their phone or their quest on who clicked a link and then the artist was standing here on their desk and they could spin them around and talk to them and take a photo and share it. Um, and, and it was great. We had a really good group of artists that came through and, and they had a lot of fun. So South by Southwest, did you have to apply for there and pay some money to do what you're doing or someone to invite you or how's that work? Uh, we, not on this case. Uh, um, I mean, you know, for people to go to South by Southwest and get a badge, there is a fee or you can panel if you're on a panel, then, then that covers that. Um, but for what we did, it was not an official South by Southwest okay. event. So next question, like, and I and I somebody put this on LinkedIn, like he was his he or she was saying, like, you know, understand South by Southwest is a great thing to do with a camera, but like, is it really worth it, right? Is it really worth it, you know, to go there and do the conference and do the handshake or whatever? Cause you know, instead of like focus on your business and, and working on your product and you know, doing the stuff, right? What's your take on that? It was totally worth it. I mean, I think um, you you have to show up for opportunities to appear in a lot of cases, at least in this scenario that finds itself. And, and what better place for you, for uh, what you're doing, right? I mean, yeah. what better place than that? Yeah. There's another conference coming up next week that I'm not going to for the first time in many years called Music Biz out of Nashville. And that's another good one. But I saw so many people at South by Southwest. There's just a lot of meetups, music industry meetups, or you just run into people on the street. Um, and there is definitely a, a awareness and understanding that there's this new world opening up. And there are quite a few, well, maybe I would say six to 12 companies that are also in a similar space to where Poppins is, where it's something new. And, uh, and I got to meet several of those people too, because I think it's, we're all going to be better if we partner versus try to compete. Yeah. Uh, and uh, some random things, you know, I met a couple of people I wasn't expecting to meet or people that saw me that I hadn't seen for a while that just, Hey, Christina. And then you know, I'm a big believer. You talk to anyone for a little while, there's something you can do together. Yeah, I believe too. Now, how, how long is, is South by Southwest? Is, is, is it like a month long or is like? Uh, it's uh, probably about seven to 10 days now. It? And it's, okay. there's an interactive portion, a cinema portion, a music portion. So the music portion is generally Wednesday to Saturday okay. at the end. Okay. And we came in, we came in on Saturday or Sunday to catch some of the interactive piece. Okay. I'm guessing you're going to do this again next year. Yeah, can. I think we will. Yeah, I think that we called those the future future reality series. Yeah. And I think we will do a second set of those next year. So you, um, you have your, you're a co-founder of a startup. You're working with three nonprofits. Uh, you have a wife, a mother. Or she has friends you hang out with. You have a lot going on. Having said that, how do you take care of yourself? 
you know, <laughs> get a lot of sleep. Yeah. I, you know, uh, I used to not sleep and now I really like to get my eight hours of sleep. Okay. Um, so that's one thing I don't do it as regularly as I should, but I do love to meditate. Okay. Um, and there's some great apps online that are free. Is it daily insight is the one? Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I use that one. Yeah. It's there. great. You yeah. could just do 10 minutes. The only problem know? is like have so many people on there. You're scrolling like her, her yeah. time limits. You're like, I was like, there's too many for like, you know, like female voice, male voice, music, meditation, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, yeah. you know, like, man, this, let me pick one. Yeah. Well, I definitely have hearted a few of them mm -hmm. that I will go back to yeah. again and again, or sometimes I will like, Oh, I only got five minutes. I'll yeah. filter it for five minutes and see what comes up. And I kind of know what I want. So um, that helps. So what made you want to become an entrepreneur coming from Microsoft? Uh, so I feel really lucky that I graduated from college and got that job at Geffen Records that was a 14 plus year job and then went straight from that into Microsoft and did 18 years at Microsoft. I was ready not to go sit at a desk. I was ready to do something I wanted to do um, and that was meaningful to me. Um, and so it was when Brian, Brian actually was the one who first called me when I left Microsoft with some work. And that sort of gave me the nudge to start Calio Music instead of, I would have probably not thought about it very hard and gone straight into looking for another corporate gig, just because that's what I was used to, take care of your family and the bills and all those kinds of things. Um, and then it just opened my mind up, you know, and now I tell people pretty regularly, like, don't count out the idea of starting your own business. Yeah. You know, you don't have to do it the way you don't have to do the whole go to college after high school and then get a job and then buy a house. And you don't have to do that. No. And that's what I like this generation. I think they like, know that, right? Like, why go to college? You got $100,000 of debt, you know, some cubicle that you're not going to like, right? I mean, it's, there's yeah. so many more opportunities out there, you know? Yeah. And, and I think the challenge is all these corporations haven't, like, figured that out yet, right? They're still trying to, like, hire people the old way, you know, come work for me for 20, 30 years. Yeah. It would kill me when, like, you're at a company, like, all the time on LinkedIn, I come and say, you know, I can't believe so-and-so left me with no notice. Well, I remember two years ago, you laid everyone off and, 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 and took the pension plan from them, right? Yeah. Like, are you kidding me right now? Like, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's really changed. I think it's good. Right, I mean, too. I think that I see a lot of people, even when I was at Fender and I was hiring a whole team, um, most of the people I was interviewing with were at their jobs one or two years yeah. and then would switch. Whereas before, you know, that would be a big red flag. Yeah. It was like, no, that's just how people get their experience and yeah. move forward. If that show, if you stay at a job one or three years, you're actually losing money because New people come in, they get like higher raises. You're still stuck the same pay rate. So yeah. Yeah, everyone says like, you need to move around too. I think I remember if you, if you said a job for like, three years, like you're like screwing yourself over as far as salary and stuff. Yeah. And opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. It's really changed. It, it has a lot. So, um, so Poppins, well, how, did, well, how did the name come about? The oh my thing, God. It was just totally the random. list of names that we went through. Like, like yeah, I, I know. So like, it's just like, yeah, it's so frustrating. It's like, so hard to pick a name. It has to be like, you know, you need, you need the dot com dot IO, all the social media angles, you know, you have to make sure it doesn't say something like bad in a different language. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so we went through a lot. We got really close with Conjure. We thought Conjure would be a good name because you sort of conjure the hologram. Mm -hmm. um, but it had to be a weird spelling. So we were looking at these weird, it yeah. just didn't feel quite right. Um, and so we were trying to think of something that was easy, as you said, but also conveys the concept. Yeah. So it's, it's the idea of popping in. So when you click this link, you know, a hologram pops into yeah. your, into your world. So that's sort of, I think it partly also was inspired by, um, a design aesthetic, which we were embracing, which was blue note, okay. um, blue note vinyl. And um, if you ever look at the blue note vinyl albums, they're gorgeous, um, a lot of saturated color. And um, I think there's one that's called Poppin, but it's more like P-O-P-P-I-N, okay. you know, a, a jazz record. 
might be blues. Um, and so, yeah, that's pop in. Okay. And so is, is it pop in? Is it pop in? Yeah. Is it all caps, lowercase? You know, you <laughs> go through all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's amazing how much time I always say how much time, but I keep a race on, on the name, but we waste, I know I waste a lot of money time figuring it out to name it. Um, so how do you entice artists to use your platform? Like you, you like they get a, a you pay them a fee or how's that work? Uh, no, we've had some artists come to us and then we've approached artists and everyone's intrigued. I think people are struggling to make an impact and nurture what's now really a direct artist fan relationship, which wasn't so much the case in the past, at least on the major label side. So this is a really engaging way to build that relationship with the fan because now you're in 3D in their house. Yeah. Um, or for some of the artists, it's a reward for being a Patreon. So you get this special session <laughs> together. So, um, no, the artists have been incredible and I, you know, I giddy is the wrong word, but it's something <laughs> along that line, because it is when you're standing in the studio and it feels like you're probably just doing radio or TV but then we've got a monitor set up so you can kind of see what you look like. And you look like a video game character, you know, and then your mom's sending you a picture and you're standing on the record player or whatever. Um, it's it's pretty fun. The artists you work with, you have to kind of like, like train them up how to use the platform or like, you know, how to like do all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we do a little prep work. So we have both on demand. So coming in and doing a performance that we can then make available later for people to pull up or the 3D live. So we talk with them first. We talk about wardrobe because some things work better than others. Um, we, you know, describe what it's going to be like. Um, there's options for if you're doing music, if you're singing into backing tracks, or if you're bringing a guitar, or if you have a loop, you know, there's different ways that you can perform. So we we do talk through all those things in advance. So artists doing like a, a, a 3D live performance are they able to see the people watching? Like, you know, like I'm singing, I can say, hey, shout out to Tom, shout out to Mary. Thank you for watching me, Susan. Is it able to do that? Yeah, you can see on the monitor that shows you as a little hologram that you can see, there are little profile pictures with names. Okay. So you can see who's tuned in. And then, um, of course, you know, some artists, you know, they have like graphic language, graphic stuff. Does it, does the system like, okay, you can't have to be 18 years old to watch this or anything like that? Or is this... Uh, so none of our stuff has been explicit okay. to date. Okay. Um, I imagine we that will be something that we'll deal with at some point. But okay. so far, that's not. Can I imagine back in the day if, if Tulak Crew was doing this, yeah. we had to be some kind of a disclaimer or something, right? Yeah. Uh, well, it's definitely if, you know, if you're Xbox, you have to have parental controls. Okay. I think if you're pop-ins right now and an artist comes in and someone's pulling you up, that's not uh, something that we need to be super concerned about okay. right now. But I think we, if we knew we were doing something very explicit, we would probably put some kind of a warning or something somewhere. Okay. And when artists use your platform, are they able to like, you know, like sell different things, like put a link in there and say, hey, here's my next, you know, concert, here's my t-shirts. Are they able to do that? And, and if they do, do you, do you get a cut out of that? Yeah. So we're very artist friendly. So at this point we are inviting the artists into the studio and we're not charging them. Okay. So a lot of the studios charge tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars to create these volumetric video uh, experiences. We, um, so we pay the cost for that. And then if there's revenue, we share that 50, 50. Okay. So, uh, we have artist pages on our website and we're happy to point to um, their websites where they might be selling merch and things like that. We wouldn't ask for a percentage of that. Okay. All right. Um, and like, is a plan like so right now you have like pretty much, I don't say small time artists, but kind of small time artists, like how are you going to go after the big ones? What's the plan for that? Um, well, I think that'll happen naturally, naturally okay. as we move forward. I think Brian and I are, are, we have the background that we have, which so, he worked at Sony pictures. I worked at Geffen records. So, um, when the time is right, there are a lot of people that we can talk to and show them, uh, what the opportunities are. Okay. So, um, yeah, we're ready. You know, the, 
the when the right artist comes through or that connection yeah. gets made, you know, I think there will be a couple of breakout moments for AR VR for the industry. It'd be great. We'd love to be that. Yeah. Uh, I'm really curious to see what happens with Apple because they are talking about yeah, these AR out. glasses. Yeah. Um, and I would say that when iTunes launched, that was a big moment. Yeah. Um, so I think with Apple, like I thought people realize like Apple, like they're not they're innovative they're not right like it's like they sit back we want to do this but let all these other let's have a competition make all the mistakes we learn from our competition mistakes so learn from the competition mistakes and they put this product out but it's not really innovative but it's like way better than anyone else right yeah i think they have a very high quality bar and they have not put things out before they were ready yeah another thing too, i think apple does good too is like going back to the day you probably remember this when i think the the ipod first came out right at the time it was okay, right? But other products were way, way better, right? Like had more yeah. quality audio, more storage, which is me. But the other, other out of like, buy my product, we have a 3.2 hertz and 9.9, .9, there's all these right. stats and numbers. Dave Jobs, here's a thousand songs in your pocket, right? Yeah. I'm like, okay, who are you going to buy? What are you going to buy? Something you understand? All these jargon numbers, right? Yeah. And they did a serious marketing campaign around that yeah. too. I mean, there were billboards and, yeah. you know, um, it really just kind of, cracked i think the culture yeah you know, so people went oh i get it now yeah yeah definitely so as far as being an entrepreneur talk about some challenges well actually let me rephrase that what's from your point of view what's some pros and cons of being an entrepreneur um pros is you're working for yourself um that's probably the con so, too <laughs> yeah that's yeah, the con too yeah you're right yeah, um, yeah so I, there's no like time off um really so uh but i really am so appreciative of that flexibility having kind of been on someone else's clock for yeah. that many years um and then there's just the wide open potential like you know you could dream anything and and things happen and it's exciting and um and you know it was just you and your partner that was that we're pulling that together along with anyone else who yes. helped, you know, and all the others that are there because it's definitely a team effort. Yeah. Uh, and I'm lucky. I've had a great support from friends and family. That's so too. important. Like mm -hmm. I can imagine being an entrepreneur, like your friends and people don't support you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely had a lot of support. Yes. So like, um, you was at Geffen works for 14 years, Microsoft 14 years. So obviously you're not your, your mid twenties anymore. Yeah. Can you talk about how, like, how at your age you used to have this focus and drive, or like a lot of people don't have the focus and drive? Yeah, um, I, you know, maybe it's just um, people are different, but um, my husband's the same way. Like, we're not looking to retire. Um, it's like the adventure is in front of us. So. Um, it's just, uh, it's just not a mindset that I have right now. I feel more probably motivated and inspired to be stepping out into this new phase where I get to kind of try to build something. And what advice do you have? Like, do like someone post one that has an idea, right? They have no co-founder. We have no money. Like, what advice do you have for them? So someone who has an idea for a new business, um, so for me, I like to write things down. So I like to just kind of spell it out as far as what the idea is, what the next steps would be and what the result might be after that. And then it's a matter of just chipping at that and uh, finding people that can play a role and and doing it. Um, I had, So when I graduated from college, my friend Beth and I decided to go to LA for what we thought was going to be a couple of months. And we packed up my little red Toyota Tercel with like the ironing board <laughs> hitting the ceiling, like couldn't see anything. And we stopped in Vegas on the way down for fun because you do that. Um, and when we left, we were just like talking and listening to music. And about two hours later, we realized that we were going east instead of south. And so we decided we would just keep going that we didn't have to actually be in LA for any specific thing. And we drove all across the country. We went up to Canada and we came That's back. That's a hell of a detour. It was great. And we saw all these things that, you know, we might not have. And it was just because we decided to do it. 
And so that's something that's really stuck with me. And a lot of the time when you have an idea, you really just have to take the first, like almost physical step to just do it. And then all of a sudden you're going to be doing it just to make it real. So as an entrepreneur, do you have any red flags? Like, you know, if this red flag, I'm going to stop doing the business, you know, like, you know, if I don't get funding or like, you know, if some developer tells you it's going to cost hundred thousand dollars, do y'all have a red flag where you're going to set everything down? No, we haven't talked about a red okay. flag. Um, we talk about where we're at. We just did this morning uh, all the time and kind of assess where's the market at. Um, I think coming out of CES this year, uh, talking to people at South by Southwest, just others in the industry, there's a general feeling that it's going to take a little longer than everyone thought to get to the point where there are a lot of headsets, AR, VR yeah. in the marketplace. Um, so I think the people that are in the industry still believe in AR and VR, but there is a awareness that the devices that were expected from Google and Samsung and like, you name it are not going to be here on the time frame that was originally projected. So, you know, you kind of have to just reevaluate yeah. all the time. I mean, we, over the weekend, we switched gears and we're talking about a lot of really interesting things we might do in, in sports. Um, so we're not limited to music or comedy. Okay. Um, and th I mean, that's part of the fun of it is constantly sort of, is this right? What if we did this and being able to do that? Now these headsets, are they, are they like pretty expensive or like pretty average price? Yeah, or? they're pretty expensive right okay. now. So, you know, you get a quest two, which is, used to be the Oculus for about $300. Okay. And they're great, but they are pretty bulky okay. and they're really more virtual reality glasses. Okay. Um, yeah, I think there was a leaked price point for Apple AR glasses at 3000, but yeah. I don't know if that's legitimate or not. Yeah. Have you ever talked about making those things yourself? So that's like outside of scope. Yeah, that's outside of scope for us. Okay. And, and Brian and I were both at um, Zune, so we saw what it took to actually put okay. a piece of hardware into the marketplace. All right, so it's a, a big leap. It's a lot. That's a okay. lot. I yeah. think I know, like off the top of my head, like you could build these headsets and like rent them out to people, right? Mm -hmm. That's a few or something. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a company called Amaze VR, and they had a Megan Thee Stallion uh, hologram, and you would go into physically into a venue, like a seated venue. And they would give you an Oculus okay. and there'd be a DJ, you know, before that. And then you'd all watch and experience the VR together. Um, so yeah, there's all kinds of different ways that people doing AR and VR. So speaking of DJ, do you have any, like, any DJs on that platform? Um, no, but we're really looking forward to doing a DJ. Okay. Um, yeah. The challenge we had initially was if this was a deck, and we were surrounded by cameras right now, the, this would be blocking me. Okay. So the cameras can't then see that piece. Okay. So then when you're looking at it in AR VR it could create kind of a hold or, okay. or a little artifact. So there's some challenges to equipment like that. Okay. that um, so how are y'all making money? Like where's the, where's the business model? Who's paying for this? Well, today there's the NFTs. Um, we think there's a big market in advertising. So we've created a little graphic that moves along with the AR that <clears throat> would work very well for an app. Oh, gosh. For example, like if 7up did something with us, you could have a QR code on the 7up. And this is Sir Mix a lot. If you scan this with your phone, Sir Mix a lot's going to jump up and saying, oh, baby got back. Oh shit. Yeah. And that's then you crazy. can take a picture. You could that's, move that's it. Like in. Some, that's like some Star Trek, Star Trek stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And this is, I have another. Example with sorry, Sassy Black. So, and that's you know, a coffee company that she works with, and the QR code again, she would come up and perform her song. Okay. Um, so things like that. Um so each time, like for her, does she get like a fee from you every time someone scans her, or how does that work? So she chose to go to market with NFTs. Okay. So she created 22, well, we worked on it together, 22 mm -hmm. NFTs that are each individual instances of her augmented reality performance. Okay that uh, people collect. Okay. So how long did it take for y'all to get some more than NFTs? Like, what the hell is this NFT thing? Like, how, do, how long did it take for y'all to figure out how to like, what is this first of all, how do I utilize this to make, make my company better? It was actually a lot easier than you might think. Um, 
someone that I worked with uh, back in the music days, David Pakman, he was at eMusic, um, got involved with crypto and Top Shot and a bunch of other um, companies. And he gave me some really good advice and introduced me to one of the major marketplaces, Rarible for NFTs. And so we had a couple conversations with those guys and they really helped us launch the first NFT that we did with Alex Shaw, which sold out in 24 hours. Like it was terrific. Um, and I, we had a conversation this morning about doing another NFT with an artist out of Dubai that we have a song with. And again, we'll probably go back to Rarible. Okay. So as far as you, what's your, like your, what's your, like your number one space? Like I said, is marketing, business development, interpersonal skills. Like what's your, like, like, okay, this is what I do like better than anyone else. Um, people have told me that the partnership piece of okay. it for me is a strength, um, okay. which I have to say, I love talking to people mm -hmm. and working with people and hearing their stories and what they want and what they're working on and then finding ways that we can work together. So it's not really work for me. Like I just, that's fun. Yeah. So when you first meet someone, how fast do you realize, okay, I can work with this person or man, I, I would never work with this person. Is that pretty quick that you can figure that out? I say I have a very open mind. So I rarely would say I can't work with this okay. person. Right. Um, I mean, that'd have to be a pretty big red flag, red flag okay. for me to feel that way. Um, not that it hasn't happened. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so Poppins for, for your hiring, is this you and Brian right now? Is a plan to bring on people later on? Or like oh yeah I think and, and how do you, you know, like how do you do you have like do you have like like you have like you know first hire developer second hire is marketing third hire is sales like do you have that broken down um I we do have a plan okay. as far as how we would go but it depends a little bit on which of the different initiatives we're pushing forward with okay. first um but yeah there is definitely some dev work that it would be great to do some things that are unique to Poppins we don't have an app so it's all web AR Okay. which is great. So we don't have anyone, there's no download, there's no headgear required. All you need is a phone. Mm -hmm. So the barrier is really low for the customer. Um, but there's all kinds of possibilities. Like you could, you could pull up Surmix a lot. And then if we had a designer, it could include special effects. Okay. Like, you know, there could be all kinds of other things that happen with that. Um, you know, I'm trying to do all our socials. That's a lot of work. I'm not doing a great job yeah, of it trust me, I know. at all. Um, I'm you know, one of the things that I'm really surprised at as far as having a business is how much writing is involved. Yeah. Like one pagers, proposals, artist bios, version 20,000 of your pitch press deck. releases. Yeah. It's a lot like of writing. Out. Yeah. So, um, What's, what's your, like your go-to social media right now? What you're getting most, the most traction on? Twitter. Twitter, okay. Yeah, for our space, which is kind of um, web three, yeah. metaverse, crypto, um, you know, the NFTs and gamers and all that. It's I'm all actually Twitter. surprised at that because it's, it's in Twitter, like more like words and stuff. I thought like would be like TikTok or Instagram because you can show videos and stuff on there more than Twitter. Well, Instagram, I would say right behind Twitter okay. and then TikTok after that. Okay. But especially, I mean, most of the artists that we work with are in their 20s. Yeah. And 30s, maybe. So um, in a lot of ways, they're not as about social yeah. media in general, but they are almost all using Twitter spaces to communicate with their fans and yeah. a lot of discord too. Okay. Yeah. I, I never got to Twitter spaces for some reason. I just never figured it out. For me, my big things are like LinkedIn, uh, TikTok and, and uh, YouTube are my main ones. Yeah. I used to be really big on Snapchat. And they, I don't know what they do with Snapchat. They made it too complicated. So I got off there. Yeah. Yeah. Snapchat is doing a lot in AR. Yeah. Um, a lot. Um, so that's on my list. I need to kind of re-engage with Snap. Yeah. So when you start hiring people, like what's your plan for that? You like just like advertise it? Like, like well, um, I'll, I'll probably call you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, probably um, there will be, there are already people that reach out yeah, that sure, are interested sure are, in yeah. working sure with us. Are, yeah. So I've kind of got a list I'm yeah. holding on to at the moment. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's usually word of mouth, right? Yeah. It's usually contacts and people that, you know, and once you know what industry yeah. or what type of person you need. Yeah. Um, so obviously like your that. first 10, 20 hours, like, you know, Brian will probably need them directly, you know, 
like here's my here's our culture, here's our values, you know, make sure it matches. But like, how are you gonna make sure your culture stays the same? You have like employee number fifty five or eighty five, right? Yeah. How are you gonna make sure that happens when you when you're trusting your your other people below you, like do the hiring, you can't be directly involved anymore. Yeah, I mean, I might turn that question around to you and see what your opinion is. I did read uh, the the guy from Zappos had a book. Um, yeah. I can't remember. It's Building to Happiness or yeah, something. Yeah, Tony something. Yeah, and that was one of the themes yeah. that he had was how important it was that they maintain that culture all the yeah. way through, and that did make an impact on me. Um, you know, I can look at my experience at Geffen Records, and that still feels like a family. And there are groups that I was in at Microsoft that felt the same way. I can't pinpoint why that worked in that way. It just seems to be. Sometimes it clicks, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just the group of people. Yeah. And a degree of um, just inclusion Mm -hmm. and transparency so that people know where the company's headed. And I think it's important to be transparent, you know? Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of people are not transparent, you know? Yeah unfortunately um, i'm all about being transparent like, yeah maybe to a fault but no, yeah i'm the same way i'm way too transparent um so so far everything's bootstrapped right yes yeah is the plan to actually do a fundraiser in the future or um yeah we're we're we just started having that conversation okay. um and i think we'll be moving into that phase this month next month okay. as far as building the plan yeah. to do it that wti group that you and i were both in i thought that was great yeah. Like I learned a lot. Um, so I'm guessing like the most uh, investor you need to talk about going to be in LA, right? Versus like, of course, everyone's on San Francisco, but I'm guessing like most of the investors you need to be in the LA area, right? The entertainment. Yeah. And actually, I think our, the first thing we do here, will just be friends and family. Yeah. So what else? Um, how are you actually marketing this? Is this word of mouth, right? Yeah. And then with the artist. Okay. So uh, these artists have fan bases and so they're taking it out to those fan bases one of the next things that i think we will do is find some partners that can amplify the programming that we do we're just moving into serialized content so with 3d live we've done for the last four months we've done a session and we'll continue to do that so that there's a regular cadence of 3d live shows um and we do have a vision that at some point people will want a 3d tiktok meets netflix meets youtube and we'd like to either be the ones that aggregate that data and make it available as a channel or be a primary uh supplier so a platform is a limit on how much you're doing that like can can right now can you like do a 100 concerts in 100 different cities we could yeah okay so the platform supports that no okay yeah, there's um, there are updates coming in the next month too that are gonna. I mean, the the team at Form of Vision is constantly yeah. updating. Okay, and like in the local areas, do you like, do you, do you, have, do you all go like the jazz malls or Tacoma and say, hey, let me do this 3D stuff here, or like how do you work with that? Um, the main venue that we've worked with here is the Crocodile. Okay. So, uh, and I think you said you haven't been down there yet, no. the new one. So, um, what was that? What neighborhood is that in? Belltown. Belltown, okay. Yeah. And it's multi-level. So at the bottom, there's like a comedy club that's more like a small theater with okay. seats, but they have shows in there too, like music shows and other shows. Um, and then there's a main big room that's like a stage at the end and a bar at the other okay. side and dark and like full on rock mm-hmm. venue. Um, and it's also a hotel. So on the top floor, there's six to eight rooms and a little lobby area and that's where we've done some of our um 3d lives okay so after sound check and before the show the artists can come up and for their fans that can't be in seattle it's a chance to tune in and hear a couple of songs and talk to the artist um and the crocodile's been a great partner as okay. we've experimented with that good um, we've done it twice so you talk about your business model so is there such thing as a perfect customer for you? Uh, today, someone like Seven Up would be a perfect customer. Okay. You okay. know, someone that had uh, an online presence and a physical presence, so that we could put the QR code um, okay. on there. Yeah. And when like somebody at home uh, 
does use a, use a platform. Do they have to pay a fee for it? No, so it's no, totally it's free. always free. Okay. Yeah. I, that could change. Of course, if there was an artist that said, I want to do a show at six o'clock and I want to sell a ticket for it, we could do that. Okay. So it's pretty like, you know, looking for pretty flexible. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that artists would say, like, you know, like you would say no to like post artist says, I want to do, I don't know. There's something crazy off line. Is there any like limits? Something we say, okay, we can't do that. Um, oh, I mean, I yes, mean, there are things that, um, artists have said, can we do that? We can't do yet, okay. you know? So it is a roadmap. It's, this is really early technology. Yeah. Um, and I think, as I said, I think I was form vision is really leading the way. So things are developing as we're moving along. So form of vision, it's not like you really count them to be a big part of what you're doing, oh, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. What would happen? Like, I'm sure you have a plan. If they said like they went out of business or said want to deal with you no more, what would be, what's your plan for that? Uh, I think we would take a hard look at it. We could do what we do with other volumetric oh. video studios. Okay. Um, so but we, no plan to do that yourself though, right? No. Unless you no. absolutely have to, unless someone gave you like $25 million to said build so, it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we don't have a plan to build it ourselves. Okay. No, they're great partners. Good. So, so Poppins, can you go like more detail, like how the company got started, what you focus on now and what the future vision is for the Poppins? Uh, so I, Brian came to me and said, do you think there's something here? And it was just before the holidays. And we, um, in 2020, so the pandemic was happening already. Um, we had the idea that we could do Santa Claus or other holiday characters and because the malls were shy of having, you know, people weren't going to malls and sitting on Santa's lap. Um, but it was too late, you know, it was already like the middle of November. So we did tape a Santa, like we have, we have a couple Santas. Um, and we ended up doing something the next year with children's hospitals. So kids that were in hospital that couldn't go be, meet Santa could have Santa there and take a photo or play with him. Um, but that's when we started. Yeah. And then it turned into, we just kept talking and it sort of snowballed. And then we said like, yeah, let's go into partnership and start a company. So it was pretty natural. Yeah. And what, what's the focus for the Poppins right now? We're really focused on the 3D live streaming element of it. So um, we started by doing a lot of these pre-recorded pop-ins. We've got maybe over 20. Um, and then the last few months, we've been focused on 3D live sessions. So we want to build, you know, it'd be great to get to a point where if you were home at night, you said, now oh, there's nothing on TV. I wonder what's on pop-ins, you know. So why focus on that was the hundreds of other things you could focus on. The entertainment piece of yeah. it or pop -ins? Um I don't know if I'm ever going to get away from music, you know, it's just <laughs> like in me now. Yeah. Um, it's been my career it was what I loved before I started a career. I'm married to a musician. Um, it's just my life. So, um, and Poppins isn't just music. It's comedy. It's dance. Gaming. It's gaming. It's sports. Like we're going to expand. I miss like yeah, the, the possibilities are limitless, I think. Yeah. And what, what's a, what's your vision for the company? Um, well, a couple. One is definitely to create this 3D channel. So instead of just watching your flat screen TikTok, um, you're going to watch a stream of produced content and user upload in 3D. So it'll be a much more... One thing that people say they feel like, even if I'm, it's me in the studio and I'm demoing it to someone like you, if you had me here or there, it's like there's a sense of presence that you get when someone is there in your space, even though you're still looking at your screen to see the person, but they feel like they're there. Um, and I think it's part of why this whole new phase of video is gonna be compelling. You all do anything on Twitch? Twitch is gonna be great for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah we haven't done anything yet there, but. Okay. And so you mentioned product roadmap earlier, like how do you and Brian like determine your product roadmap? What's the process for that? Uh, we do a lot of paying attention to what's happening in the marketplace, um, trends, uh, hardware, monitoring what other 
companies are doing, the big ones and the little ones. Um, and then looking for what is sort of native to Poppins, like what makes sense to, to us now. So um, we were really focused on the on-demand piece. And then when the 3D live streaming kind of became good enough to do, we shifted focus to that. And I'm sure that'll continue to happen. So how have you dealt with this, right? Like, like for me personally, in my mind, where I'm at right now, I've been like a year and a half ago, right? It's like, it's like, it's fucking slow as shit, right? How have you had the patience to like deal with the slowness and like the, the, the progress you make when it's never fast enough? So it hasn't been slow for us um, because we haven't been out there on the fundraising side. So we've been sort of building momentum, I would say more than that. Um, and probably there's a lot more that we could do than we are doing because it is just the two of us. And so we have some limits, sort of self-imposed limits um, as we kind of develop our thinking and, and partnerships and all of that. So how hard is it y'all two not to say like, okay, it's only two of us, we're doing the best we can. We gotta bring someone else in. Like how's that conversation go? Like we bring someone else in, like you make them a co-founder they from the cap table intern or do y'all just say, okay, we're, like, we're gonna suck it up and be a two man show until later down the road. Um, so far it's been okay to be a two person show. Uh, I think we're right now at the beginning of that path to being more than that. You know, I think we've, we've reached that point where we need to take this, or we both want to take this to the next level and to take it to the next level, we'll need some money and we'll need some resources, including people. And if you already start reaching out to investors yet, like start conversations or down the, later down the road. That'll be next after this okay. next phase. Yeah. So we both just finished WTIA. Have you done any other incubators, accelerators besides that one? No, we got right after WTIA, we um, were offered the BPI tech okay. board. Um, and that's the last thing that we've joined. I haven't been pursuing anything else because we've just been busy. So I know there's like the tech stars, why she commented all these yeah. like tech startup things. Is there any like incubators, accelerators like specific for music tech startups? Yeah. Okay. Um, there are a couple of them like music ally, which was the one that okay. we mentioned is definitely that, um, there's a tech stars component in LA. That's very, okay. has been very music focused. Um, yeah. So just a handful. So how you do this? You know, like you, you have all these advice, people telling you what to do, right? Like people say, on, on, focus on sales, focus on product, focus on market. Like how do you personally decide what day what to focus on? Well, up until now, we've really been focused on learning, uh, learning what is working and what's happening in the marketplace and what works and doesn't work for artists and just optimizing what we're creating. Uh, but I think partially probably because it's going to take longer, as I mentioned, for some of these headsets. And we're at the point now where we really do need to focus on who's the customer and where's the money. So on a day-to-day -day basis, like, of course, you probably have a hundred things you want you to do, right? Day-to-day, -day, how do you make sure you focus on number one and two versus working on number 77? Um, this is a place where I think Brian and I are a good uh, balance in that we can catch each other if someone is going too far off something that doesn't matter. Um, and refocus. Like we do have kind of a touch point where we check yeah. to see what we're focused on. And uh it hasn't been it hasn't been too hard to do that. I mean, okay. we've definitely both gone into like chased something yeah. maybe farther than we should have. Um, because there's so much, you know, that's I guess part of the fun of being your own boss is you can kind of dream big and yeah, you know, try things that uh, that someone might not green light otherwise. But you do have to kind of um, come back to the nuts and bolts. A lot of the time we do have a schedule, a content schedule, like we have artists coming in or events that we want to get to. And so it's very clear the stuff you have to get done because otherwise you're going to show up and nothing's going to happen. So there's some logistics. So how do you run communicate? Like y'all communicate like meetings three, four times a day? Is this a Slack message? Like how y'all like keep in touch, so to speak? Uh, telephone texting and emailing. Okay. I'd say those are the main ways. Uh, and the 
lots of Zoom calls and Zoom or Google Meet or whatever else it is, Blue Jeans yesterday, <laughs> uh, with with partners. And how often do y'all actually meet in person? It's not very regular. So we've both traveled a bit. So this is the beauty of working in 2020 and beyond yeah. is that it doesn't really matter where we are. Um, when Brian's in town, we get together probably almost every day or okay. every couple of days, at least for a minute. The studio is in Georgetown, so okay. it's not very far away. So anything that we were doing from the studio, we would obviously meet up there. Okay. Um, but we had a couple like restaurants that we would just go sit outdoor with a coffee, you know, um, and do some meetings too. So I'll ask you a tech startup and, and like, is there any, like, of course, count VR, AR, all that stuff. Is there any like new tech that's out there that like, really excites you? Um, they either like right now they're doing or like you hear like they're, they're going to do this in the future. It's a great question. What else? I mean, the world is buzzing about AI. Yeah. So that's um, something that is helpful to us as far as the AR VR creation is. And I'm, I haven't been using Jet GPT as yeah, much as I, I would I, like I, to. I haven't used it. I've used it a couple of times. And like, like yeah. first, I don't, I don't get it yet, right? I haven't used it. I, I like, to me, it's just another Google, right? But I'm probably yeah. not using it like I need to. Yeah, I think you're going to get a lot more out of it than yeah. that when you, like even this marketing call I have with these um, music executives every week, they're using it to write artist bios. They're using it to write briefs, you know, because you can really give it a lot of information. So totally random. So I was in Vegas this weekend for a wedding, right? The best man, his his speech was on Chat GPT. No way. Yeah, he did that. He put a Chat GPT like, and it, it did the speech for him, right? Oh my God. I said, this is hilarious. Was it good? It was damn good. <laughs> it was freaking good, right? That's good. That's funny. It was like it was like scary how good it was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, AR and VR, I think, have a lot. Um, I think quantum computing is something that is going to have a major impact, but I couldn't tell you exactly. Yeah. What that's going to mean, but I think that's going to be a technology that'll also be. Yeah, I, I don't think people realize like every maker realize how far tech has come, right? Like. I watched a, a listen to podcast. This guy was there. He said, like in his lifetime, he went from playing pong to like what's going on right now, right? Yeah. Like less than forty years, right? Yeah. And you think about we went to, from from Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, in 1913, a man on the moon in 1969, right? Yeah. The advance we we're seeing, like it's just mind boggling, right? And no one can, no one can keep up, right? Yeah. And that's like example, like AI, like it's gonna take away 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 everyone's jobs, right? You know, like, and if it does, then you have to do universal basic income, you know, like we're somewhere like AI is not gonna take your job. But someone who doesn't use AI is going to take your job, right? It's all this like, man, like, is, is society ready for this? I don't think they are. Yeah, I think there are some questions. Yeah, like I read somewhere like, you know, uh, the, what's it called? The autonomous trucks are going to take over that, you know, you don't need any truck yeah. drivers, right? So like, yeah, so there's 250,000 truck drivers in the United States. So like all the job is instantly, right? Yeah, that's a big hit, you know, like. That'll be the the cars that drive themselves in the trucks. That'll be really interesting. Yeah. And like, like, like question, like, you know, like you out for a club, you get drunk right over and you get your, your, your test, like drives yourself and the cops pull you over. Like you get to your eye, like you're not driving, right? Oh yeah. I don't <laughs> think you're getting, unless, unless it's the not fully self-driving and you're still yeah. supposed to be in control yeah. of it, Yeah. which I think is the current model. Right. Yeah. And there's uh, so many questions like no one has the answer to, right. I don't yeah. think like AI is like, yeah, it's this craziness. Yeah. But I do think the right approach is to learn it mm -hmm. instead of just like shut it out. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Like, like they should be teaching it in schools, not. Oh yeah. I know. It out. Like, like I think they teach code like it's in a high school, right? Let's be teaching mm -hmm. elementary school. Yeah. But I mean, even AI, like yeah. chat, yeah, true, yeah. GPT, like how do you use it? Yeah. And, and remember they had the, the hearings in, in DC for the TikTok CEO. And like, I was so embarrassed. Like these people represent us, right? Like, are you kidding me right now? Like, come on, God. Yeah. Like, I know you got a. I know you got a young intern. Like having yeah. an intern brief you know, this stuff works. Exactly. You know? Yeah. It's yeah. like this is ridiculous, right? Like the question they ask. Like, are you kidding me right now? Yeah. Like seriously. Like, yeah. Yeah. Bad. Man, crazy. So, Christine, is there anything I, I should have asked you that I didn't, or anything else you want to talk about? Well, actually, we're, 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 I guess just to do this demo real fast. Wrap up this. Oh, sure. This up real fast. This is something that we did for Music Ally, I think, who wanted something in video to explain what it was that we were doing. Cool. 
I think AR is one of these very few profound technologies that we will look back on one day and when what how did we live our lives without it? I want to go back to the middle part of your fucking front of the This right here, like, that to me is like blows my mind right here. Yeah. Like, that's to me, that's, that's just freaking insane. Yeah. Well, this is part of the fun of it. Like, we, we, we've done a couple photo booths where uh, people can stand and we can put the artist next to them. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's what's happening here. Smash. So okay. That's Tomo with a bunch of people that were standing in front of me. But yeah, you can make them big, small, spin them around. Like, you know, if it was an artist you really loved, to have that I'm talking about interaction presence. with someone. Yeah. Like interaction with someone. Yeah. In a way you would never get. You know, most people are not going to meet all of their favorite artists. So this might be sound kind of creepy, but like, can someone like pull an artist in, like have the artist 24 7? Like, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's kind of creepy, I think, you know, but like, you know, like kind of stalkerish, yeah. you know, but man, this yeah. Is yeah. You can do that. You can make, we had one uh, video editor that made a whole music video using the AR, but in their home, mm -hmm. like, you know, yeah. So speaking of like stalker skipper stuff, what do you do to like protect your company, make sure that that stuff doesn't happen, right? Well, at a certain point, you know, that's something you just warn the artist. Like okay. once this is out, like, yeah, the person can probably put you in somewhere you don't want to be, you yeah. know, but um, that's the nature of the technology. And what, what the Tim Cook in your video, what, that you just pulled his video from somewhere or you got permission from uh, him? Or? Yeah, Apple is more and more talking out about AR okay. and the potential. For it. Yeah, okay. so we just do the credit there. Nice, nice, nice. Um, is there an artist like you really want to try to target, target a new feature to get on your platform? Um, we're really open minded. I think a K pop artist would be oh, really wow. interesting. Oh, wow. That'd be, big. That'd be nice. You yeah. Know, that's Those a, are some real fans. You talk about Africa blowing up. K-pop is like this, yeah. Yeah. Blowing your blowing people's minds. Yeah. Taylor Swift. Let's, of course, let's get yeah. Her in. Yeah. Um, is there like a type of music that's best for this, like rap music or rock music or country music, or this doesn't matter? Uh, I think actually it will matter. I, I'm i eager to experiment with rap, which mm -hmm. we really, hip hop, which we really haven't done yet. Um, you know, I think uh, the gaming uh world is yeah. one we haven't really tapped into it's a possibility on limitless yeah. for your company i yeah. think right this yeah. is the things y'all can do yeah it's it's insane like and and, and just like you know off, off your business right you do a business meeting like pop into the business meeting right yeah and that and that's really what form and vision is doing mm -hmm. they'll they'll have that kind of 3d meeting yeah christine is there anything i should ask you that i didn't or anything no. else you want to talk about no 
This has been great. Thank you very much. Yes. Really nice. So if we get out of here, can you give us any last minute wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Uh, I would say just keep going and keep a sense of humor. <laughs> like There are a lot of sticky uh, situations that we all find each other in. And uh, someone told me once, I think it was wedding advice, like try to find something to laugh about <laughs> and it, it'll be better. That and music, like, honestly, don't forget music if you're down. Christina, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much. You know, to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.